Good morning and welcome to the Morning Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cam, coming to you as always from the Spotlight Studios here in Morristown, New Jersey. My guest today is the CEO of Aquaseca, an emerging leader in intelligent water management. Aquaseca is a young company dedicated to data-driven solutions for smart building management and efficient use of our limited water resources. My guest is aiming to improve water efficiency for all of Aquaseca's clients. She is Nancy Hartsock. Nancy, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's exciting to have you on. So we've really only done, I think, maybe one other episode that kind of dealt with this sort of thing. Um, you know, sustainable buildings, smart buildings, um, trying to control some different things. So uh, I guess my first question would be, why water? Like, are you? Is it a passion of yours to to save water? Like, when when did that start? When did the passion start? <laughs> Yeah, so so I've always uh, been very focused on the environment, if you will, and and is it the environment? It's really taking care of where we live is what it's about. Um, spent the last decade prior to Aquaseca in the solar industry, uh, clean energy, renewable energy, that place. Really fell in love at that point with the concept of of clean tech. Um, became clear that a lot of technology innovation had happened during that time period, but that we were at a point where it was much more now about deploying it versus innovating it. And so started looking around saying, okay, where else in the, in the world of things we should be taking care of are we not? And water became that area very quickly for me. You know, it's, it's, uh, in, it's a very limited resource. We don't ever get any more. Right. Uh, and the population's growing and everything we're doing is using more and the climate is changing. And, you know, it's just, uh, it would just kind of hit the point. Uh, we need to be much more responsible about water usage. But it, as we looked at it, and as I looked at it, it's, it's really impossible to be responsible about it if you don't know how you're using it. Right. Yeah. If you have no data, you can't track anything. Right. Right. Which I'm sure right. we're going to get into more teaser later in this episode. But um, so you start before Aquaseca, um, you were in the solar industry. So has your whole career kind of been in this sustainable type of systems and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, I, I actually moved into that with solar. Prior to that, it was uh, more, more time than I probably like to say in electronics, semiconductors, uh, computer chips. I was kind of in the world of semiconductors in the Silicon Valley, uh, but always in technology, technology marketing and selling. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, take a position at a solar company that was doing very innovative technology. And I, it was a very exciting moment because I sort of thought I would spend the rest of my career with chips. Sure. Right. And uh, and I didn't. And it, it, it was a great thing not to have to do. I I sometimes laugh at my son was in high school at the time and thought it was the first time I had a cool job in my whole life. You know, I, I thought I'd had a cool career, but apparently right. not. When I, I went not. into solar, yeah. I was now a cool mom. So right. that was pretty, that was pretty exciting. And uh, that was the first time I think that the product, the need became greater than the product. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things we had new technology there and it was clear that, that the industry needed to look at it different. The world needed to look at it. So got very involved in creating some industry organizations to advance technology and, and looking at it not just as one company, but as an industry. And we're hoping to be able to do that in water as well. Um, right, right. So Aquaseca, how old is Aquaseca? Aquaseca is uh, from, from conception today about five years old. Okay. From having a product that we're developing about three years. Right. So you, when you make this, when you decide to make this move from solar into water, um, talk to me about that because we have like, I I mentioned to you, but kind of before we started and on a phone call a couple weeks ago that a lot of the people that I have listened to this show are young professionals. So they're entrepreneurs, they're real estate investors, they're whatever people that are involved in real estate in some capacity. But, um, talk to me maybe about, can you talk about the process of how it was, you know, starting, uh, a brand new company, I would imagine, right? Brand new company right, um, with no, I mean, I know that you're developing the product and now you have a product, which we'll talk about. Um, but talk to me about that, like that process, you know, getting a team in place, uh, you know, are you pulling people from the solar world? Or are you pulling people from the water world? What's that like? Yeah. So, so we started out probably with, uh, I had a co-founder at the time that really was the innovator behind the technology itself that had the idea, could you really monitor water from outside the pipes? Can you, can you, can you know what's going inside a pipe from the outside? Right. And uh, can we do that with acoustics? And it was some technologies and, and machine learning that we had applied in the solar industry. But the question was, would they work? So probably put about two years into the science of 
no one's done what we've done. Can we do it? Right. Uh, so at that point, we really weren't looking at products. We were looking at, is there a market need and can it be executed from a scientific research perspective? Um, once we got there, the, the key was, what do we need next? Well, the next, we need a data phone, a founder that was a data scientist, right? Because this is a data-driven product. And, right. and the problem with water is it wasn't a data-driven industry. Yeah. But then neither was electricity two decades ago. Right. right? right. So, and, and I draw a lot of analogies between energy efficiency and where it was, you know, 20 years ago where people just used electricity and we didn't really think about it. You flipped the light switch, it came on. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we have all these new devices that need electricity and we're doing stuff that requires data centers and the price of electricity starts going up Right. and supply gets limited. And all of a sudden we birth gives given to energy efficiency, you know, which is now, I don't know, $350 billion business in right. a couple of decades. And with water, we're on the nascent edge of that, Right. There just hasn't been an efficient way to measure. So going back to your question, which you probably appreciate. Uh, so so we, we added the data scientist. And then from then, it really is kind of a back and forth between talking to customers. You know, we, we were very focused on this water efficiency, but it became quite clear that while the world wants it, at that stage, you know, four or five years ago, nobody was willing to pay for it. Right. Uh, we want it. We want to do good. We want to. We want to be these responsible people. But you know, I can't pay for it. Water's not that expensive. Yeah. And so, what's really changed since then is, you know, today water is the fastest raising rise, rising cost of any of our utilities. Right. Two, there's become very obvious there's a worldwide shortage of water. Uh, but more importantly, the same technology we're using to monitor water also tells you: Do you have a leak in your building? Do you have mal uh, or is equipment malfunctioning and wasting water? So not only can you address with the approach, and once we realized we had these two layers that could be addressed at the same time, it gave you the low lower operating costs, reduced damage to property opportunity on which you could build a base of putting sustainability on top of that. Right. And the combination of those makes a very strong value prop. Yeah. You know, by itself, the sustainability wasn't. You know, if I look out four or five years, I think sustainability rules. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, right. You know, uh, but the, but there's no change in our product. Once you're collecting data from outside the pipes of what's going on inside them throughout complex buildings, all of a sudden you can analyze that data anyway. You know, we sort of create a digital twin of a building. And once you've done that, you can cut and dice it any which way to understand what's going on. That's very cool. So can we let's learn a little bit more about we've danced around it plenty of time so far. So let's learn a little bit about the product, you know, and like what it is that you guys are bringing to these building owners and all that kind of stuff. Certainly. So we have a platform, which is and I, I call it a platform because uh, it's a living platform. It's not a product skew, if you will. Right. Uh, but we use acoustic sensing on the outside of pipes. So if you look here, I've got this sensor uh, that just straps on a pipe. If my finger were a pipe, it would just be strapped on there with a tie wrap. And you use, they're, they're small and expensive sensors that are sprinkled throughout a building's plumbing, wherever you have pipes accessible, behind sinks, uh, you know, behind equipment, not, not behind walls, but wherever you can easily strap them on. And the sensors are collecting and processing acoustic data. And they corroborate data between each other. So part of our IP is around this parallel processing of the data. And by doing that, we don't monitor, you know, if I attach the sensor on a pipe under a sink, I'm not monitoring that pipe. I'm monitoring, <laughs> I'm monitoring everything, <laughs> everything within the audio range of the sensor. And plumbing and building sort of like a waveguide through the building. Yeah. Right, sound travels in water. So this allows us to not monitor at the point where we attach a sensor, but you're monitoring at the point at which water's flowing or where problems are occurring. So that that pipe that's behind the wall that's now got a seal that's leaking, right? That you don't know about for a couple of months. You know the sensors know about. Yeah. So so these sensors they communicate through a gateway and they learn the operational footprint of the building, and thereafter uh, anomaly detecting algorithms are at work in the cloud, understanding, hey, that should not be happening. 
I don't know what that is. That can't be good. Right. Or, hey, that's the toilet, but it's been running for an hour. That's not good. <laughs> right, right. And it, 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 they're voting all the time as a group of censors as to what's going on, what it is. Is it the time of day appropriate? Is it the length of time appropriate? And in doing that, you end up with two things. You get immediate alerts if something isn't supposed to be happening, is irregular. And you get a wealth of dashboard data about how your water is used at every uh, point of use throughout a building. Right. And so the, for the people that are listening at home, uh, so here in New Jersey, New York, the tri-state area, we use Easy Pass. So it's like the little thing that you stick on the windshield and then you can go through the tolls faster. So it's basically the size of an Easy Pass. So it's not pretty non-invasive and it goes on the outside of the pipe. So that's pretty cool. So when you say acoustic data, that's like a sonar, right? Like a submarine using sonar. Is that similar? Um, a similar, yeah. I mean, water, every time water goes through a pipe, yeah, and it goes through an elbow or a piece of equipment. The acoustics change. Okay, it sounds different. If the wall, if the pipe starts freezing, the acoustics sound different. Okay. So by capturing the acoustic data, and then we send it to the cloud, where which is the heart of our system. The heart of our system is the the analytics hub in the cloud. Okay. And, and that's where we take that acoustic data and we convert it to flow data. Gotcha. And then we're analyzing the flow data as if we had captured it with flow meters inside every pipe in the building, which obviously would be extremely expensive For to sure. put a flow meter in inside every pipe in the building. Right, 100%, I would imagine. Yeah. Especially a big building, you probably got a lot of pipes, you know? Yes, yeah, so. you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and from day one, I mean, when I looked at this, I said, hey, you know, you've got $10 billion worth of damage every year in commercial buildings Yeah. From, from water leaks. That's a big problem. So why isn't that problem solved? And there were solutions out there, but they were all very expensive or they were very invasive or you had to shut the building down to install all of those things are barriers to entry yeah right they're right. barriers to doing the right thing so you know when we looked at it we said we got i call it the three c's we got to have broad coverage we have to have low cost and we have it to be convenient you got to be able to install it while the building's still working you can't cut pipes you can't shut off water you know, and then if you can do that, you, you've got kind of what happened in home security, if you will. You know, home security used to be somewhat of a niche market in a way. You know, you had to put in sensors and and uh, somebody came and did that at your house. And right. then they monitored it in place, right? Then all of a sudden came IoT and you stick up some motion sensors and you do it something on an app on your phone. And all of a sudden, again, home security is now a huge market. Yeah. Uh, and it's no longer a niche. You don't have to get broken into before you decide you want a security system. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And yeah. this, this well, one is the same type of thing. You don't need to get right. a leak before you need to fix or find out if there's a leak, right? Exactly. You yeah. don't need to have your hardwood floors trashed in order to say, geez, I should have had a detection system. Right, right. Um, so it really, I, I, I don't need to drive too many analogies, but it really opens up a whole new opportunity when you can create a solution based on all of the things that are fingertips today between IOT and acoustics and, and machine learning. Uh, it just, it just makes uh, you know, when you could take any problem and make it a data driven decision process, then what you can do with it at a very low cost is just horrendous. Right. It's, it, it often opens new markets and new opportunities for homeowners or commercial building owners. It doesn't really matter. Everybody has the same water problems. Right. And then when, so you mentioned um, over the course of these first few answers of this interview, um, some barriers to entry. And I think maybe one of the things you had mentioned before was like the cost people like understood the benefit of it, but just didn't want to pay for it. Um, so when you take this thing to, you know, I guess you would have to test it right on buildings. I mean, that's really the only way you know if it works. Um, right. So did you just like, do you start partnering with local building owners? Like, how, how did that process work to, you know, at least see how the, you know, the um, system <laughs> took place? Right. Yeah. It, it, and it's sort of like a, an escalator, if you will. We started in our homes Yeah. and we started, you know, doing those things. Then you go to some smaller buildings, then you go to some larger buildings, and then you have to fake leaks because you don't always have a leak when you need one. Right. You know, I sometimes feel bad because a, a customer's leak is my joy. Uh, <laughs> right. Because I can find it and help them, yeah. right? But you could easily install for two or three months and not have a leak, right? And that's one of the challenges with the leak detection part of it is, you know, when it, it, it's, can you know, if, if everything's going well and it's doing its job, nobody's thinking about it. Right. 
Um, and sometimes like with a lot of consumer products, if you're not in somebody's face, they forget about you. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, this same product is also providing you knowledge about, you know, you're managing a multifamily residence and you've got all of these two bedroom, two bath units, and they've all got four residents, but geez, four of them are using five X the water of the others. Yeah. You know, is there a problem? Oh, or by chance, did a few extra tenants move into that unit that right. we didn't know about in our yep. lease? I mean, you know, water correlates very closely to occupancy. Yep. So there's, you know, it's not like we want to be the watchdogs of leases for property owners, right. but yeah, it, of was, course not. it was a case It was a case that came up where they didn't realize. And when they went to look at it, it was, yeah, a couple, three, four, five extra tenants. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but uh, again, when you have the data, when you have that data about what, how you're doing things, it becomes, and you're, you've got two com- identical towers in a, in a building complex. You know, we've got owners for one said one tower was using almost twice as much water and they had no idea why Yeah. that in that case, it turned out to be a, a water feature where the makeup pump was stuck and it was just continuing to fill the water and pump it into the sewer. Um, you know, but there's, there's just, there's countless explanations like that, but, you know, going to your question of, was it just too expensive and people recognized the problem? I think it was too expensive and more importantly, maybe too complicated. Right. So you, you would, you would go to a plumbing company or you go to a plumbing service provider and you would say, geez, I've got this problem. They'd say, well, let's put these valves here and let's put these spot sensors there and let's, but none of it's communicating with each other yeah. and none of it's sending alerts. You know, I mean, the, the spot sensors used to just buzz, right? So if you're <laughs> right, if you're not there, it doesn't one, matter. One, guess where your leak is so the feet get wet. <laughs> and then two, have it happen when you can actually hear. Yeah. Now those products, those products are smarter now. They communicate a signal, right? But what we did is we said, okay, let's architect a new solution for these complex buildings. You know, let's let's we get we have the luxury of starting from scratch. Some products get evolved out of companies that are established. And there's a beauty to being able to say, okay, what's the very best way to do it? And for us, it was like having these sensors that corroborate data and talk to each other, then you can localize where problems are. You know, they can you can you can have redundancy built into the system. And and I didn't mention the one other thing when it comes to cost is we've set this up as a uh a software as a service business. So there's no upfront capital cost to the customer. It's an ongoing monitoring service, uh, which is a little different business model than it's been typically done in, in that kind of a space because it's always been a hardware driven solution. Yeah. And we're really an analytical software driven solution. Awesome. Um, one of the other things you had mentioned, um, in one of your answers, uh, I think was the digital mapping of the building. Now to me, that sounds really cool. Um, and so talk to me a little bit about is the digital map comes from these sensors or is it like you need to get blueprints and then build one and then, you know, how does that work on a case by case basis? Yeah. So, so when the, when the sensors are sending acoustic data, right, there's, they're basically telling you where water's flowing, where water is not flowing throughout a building. You know, we, we've, we've had the request and we haven't done this. This is future development for us. We believe it's totally possible to actually reverse engineer a building's plumbing. Because when you get older buildings, the thing about plumbing is, you, one, you may not ever have the plans, but if you do, it changes, yeah, right? right? New tenants want this there. And, and after a while, nobody really ha- necessarily has that footprint, which makes it harder to find things and yeah. problems. Uh, we actually think we can could reverse engineer buildings using this approach. It's not our main business now. Right. You know, but that pr- doing predictive failures for equipment. So Hey, you know, if, if you've got large filters running in a, a facility to, you know, purify water or whatever the purpose, you know, we're going to tell if those filters are starting to wear, you know, or getting full of contaminants because the water flow will change. Right. But right. we're telling that from outside. So so there's a lot of those those kind of things that can can happen with that uh, as you as you do it. But the digital twinning, I mean, that's a concept, I believe, and I I'm sure there's somebody on your podcast that may argue with me and say I'm wrong, and it's possible. But I think it was IBM initially started using that a lot in the manufacturing process, and they would contri- they would create digital manufacturing facilities to see how they would work and how they would flow. And it's sort of applying that same concept uh, to being able to tell what's happening in the building without monitoring every pipe. Right. Right. And, because that's just not realistic. 
Yeah. So, um, so Aqua Seca has been around for, you said about five years. Um, Aqua Watch has been around for how long? So Aqua Watch is the, the product we're taking commercial at this time. Okay. Is that um, what we're, that's what we're talking about, right? These sensors. Yeah. So are... we're talking to, yeah, ex- about exactly. You know, in the future, uh, next, you know, six, eight months, we'll have a product called Aqua Manage. Okay. It's the same thing, okay. but the software on it is going to o- offer even more advanced, uh, data gathering and monitoring and uh, comparative analytics, things like that. But these little guys, they never change. And and part of the beauty of the, well, they will eventually change, but <laughs> part, of the, part of the beauty of the system is, you know, I, for example, you know, if you were the people who still had satellite television, you would have a satellite on somewhere outside and you would have a receiver and you would have TV service. Yep. And then, you know, it's football season now, right? So I want the red zone so I can watch all the really good stuff. So you add that to your subscription and then, oh my gosh, there's this new HBO series that I cannot live without. So yep. yeah, make sure I got HBO. So you can add, but they can do that because your hardware is all there. It's all right. software upgrades, remote. We've done the same thing with this product. Once this hardware is installed, as we add more features and different capabilities for the product, it's a, it's a software upgrade to the customer if they want those capabilities. So you're never by, you know, by as a startup, you're right. You don't, people are always hesitant. Do I want to buy this one or do I want to wait till I get the next level? Sure. And in our case, you buy the base system today and everything we do to it in the future, you're going to have automatically uploaded your system if it's capabilities you want. Right. Um, so I guess the, the follow up to that, which is what I was kind of driving at is when you um, started with this product, uh, did you see, were there certain types of buildings that you started to put them more frequently in, or was just kind of like all over? Were they multifamily buildings? Like we talked about, were they warehouses? Were they, I don't know, any other kind? Yeah, we started looking at commercial office buildings. That was, uh, that was our very first place we looked and that's, that's a market we love. Um, there were a couple of reasons we went there first, and that is because the plumbing tends to be fairly, uh, vertical. Yeah. Right. You know, if you go in a building, you probably got all the bathrooms stacked on top of each other. Right. So the amount of sensors to monitor and everything is is much less complex. So as early on, that was important. But then, as always with a startup, things start happening that sometimes take you away from where you thought you would be. Right. And and two of those happened happened with us. Multifamily became very interested because of uh, the leak detection one but also this being able to know and in essence, almost sub meter water. Right. Um, and, and, you know, to extent now with all the rationing, there's some of these people are saying, geez, could we maybe set limits? It's not revenue grade, you know, it's not this as accurate as a revenue meter, but is it accurate enough that we could do that? And if we have tenants that are exceeding, you know, well beyond, then there's a penalty for that. So there's there's an interest level there. The other area that's uh, really popped for us is hospitals, medical centers. Yeah, And it's a little bit different there. I mean, the, the leak and stuff is important, but what's happened, and it, this has been a problem well identified in Northern Europe for a long time, which is uh, water bacteria like Legionella. Okay. And Legionella proliferates in pipes when there's no water movement. Uh, the U.S. has not worried about it as much. We put more chlorine in our water. It hasn't been as big an issue. But and the, the other issue is when somebody uh, gets Legionella, what you really get is pneumonia. OK. You just don't know what caused it. Yeah. But what has happened post-COVID with all these buildings that were shut down opening or partially opening, there's been many, many outbreaks of Legionella bacteria. Uh, and, and, and hospitals deal with Legionella bacteria all the time, right? Because they right. really can't have any bacteria. Yeah. But again, they have rooms which aren't always being used. And wherever you have pipes, water can sit stagnant, bacteria grows, and all of a sudden the whole system's polluted. Um, so the, our same system that's looking to see is water flowing when it shouldn't and how much water's flowing also can be trained to know, hey, water hasn't flowed there for X amount of time. So instead of flushing an entire hospital, on a regular basis or an entire office building, you could now just focus on the trouble areas and reduce the water waste around that as well as the manpower. Right. So um, so this health water hygiene aspect, it is something we did not see at all when we started. Uh, but a company out there that was interested saw it and, and asked us to do some special development for them, and we did. Right. Uh, and then that led it to say, hey, it could just be folded in with the product. You know, we don't tell you if your pipes are stagnant 
we tell you where water hasn't moved, you can decide if it's a problem or not. Yeah. Right. The, the science behind stagnation. Of course. That's very interesting and not something that I knew. Well, I mean, I haven't really known anything about what you've been talking about. So this is all very cool for me to learn. Um, <laughs> so I know that you are based in California. Are you doing primarily buildings in California or are you doing them nationwide or worldwide? I don't know. Uh, it, we're, we're, we're trying to stay in the U.S. right now, although we've got uh, a couple of strategic partners that are not in the U.S. that don't think we should stay here. So, uh, so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing that, but in a strategic partnered way, not like going to market in Europe on our own. Um, so we've been, but we have not been uh, California centric. Okay. Uh, it, it's interesting. It's the, the Northwest and the Southeast. Uh, and, and the Northeast, in the first place, cold climates have had a very high interest in this. Yeah. Um, around freezing, but they just, uh, maybe it's around the older buildings. Right. Uh, but the receptivity and, the, and the, the urgency of the problem seems to be greater there. Um, and uh, I think in California, we'll see a lot more interest now with all of the rationing of water uh, and the mandatory reductions that are in place. Yeah. Uh, because in a commercial building, very, very hard to manage that. You know, in a home, you could say, "Okay, everybody's taking a two-minute less shower," yeah, and right. we're not we're not going to do half loads of laundry, and the dishwasher runs, you know, every other day. And you know, you you can do measurable things, and we're going to cut our evasion. But when you've got you know thirty, forty tenants, how do you how do you manage them reducing their usage? And you're going to be under the same mandates. Right. Just, without a way to easily implement that. Yeah. So let's say I'm, you know, I live in the Northeast and you said that there seems to be like higher demand. Maybe it's because of the age of the buildings or the colder climates or whatever it is. Um, so let's say I'm a building owner here in the Northeast. So like what would be the process that I would get Aquaseca to like outfit my building with, with these monitors? Like how, how does that, how do, how do I start yeah. that process? Yeah, perfect. So, so obviously you would you would call me and sure. you would say, I'm right. desperate for easy. a problem. Could you possibly help me? And I would say, <laughs> well, of course we can help you. Yeah. But aside from that little salesy pitch there, um, what would happen is, you know, we uh, based on the size of the building, I mean, they would tell us, look, it's 12 stories. Every floor is about 10,000 square feet. Our plumbing, you know, runs up on two risers. Let's just use that as an example. So very generic description of the building. We can fairly quickly say, yeah, you'll probably need, you know, two systems per floor and that type of thing. So, so let's let's say they run on one riser. That building would need a uh, twelve-story building would need twelve systems, and so that would be twelve times five uh, sensors. Yep. And they're made to be self-installed, so we don't go do anything. Okay. Uh, the building maintenance people, and what's nice about the commercial building is you have professional building maintenance and building engineering people. Sure. They would go in, they would strap these sensors on, they would take the app on their phone, and they would identify, okay, I just installed it, let's call it Suite 360, Yeah. whatever they want to call it. They could say, you know, red, white, black room. I mean, it doesn't matter to us. Yeah. And they would, they would go through the process, then they have to train the system, which means they run water for about 30 seconds out of any outlets near it, and that trains the system, and uh, we wait... Uh, 48 hours and thereafter we're monitoring that building yeah you know the, the system has built into it yeah this are the sensors connecting to the gateway you know there's there's safeties built you know in these early installations we're usually on the phone uh partly because we need to be mostly because we want to learn we want right. to make sure that we design it so that we don't have to be there yeah it's you know if we, if we have to go out to every building to install it will be a very slow uh pr pr proliferation of the technology for sure right so is this something yeah. also like as the um, like as you have it in more buildings, different kinds of buildings, all that kind of stuff, I would imagine that the system gets smarter, right? Like it just becomes more efficient. Is that is that something it, that you've seen too? It, it does. It, the bigger the database yeah. of water, uh, of water acoustics, if you will, the more accurate and the uh, smarter it becomes. We've had a number of customers who are, uh, you know, large, these aren't, Office buildings, these are people that are like, say, large corporate customers that are producing something and they don't do anything on the cloud because somebody might steal their secrets. Yeah. Uh, in those cases, they say, could we run on a dedicated server so you never go to the cloud? The answer is yes, it's just money. Uh, but the more important answer is yes, but your system will never be as smart. Right. Because it's not going to benefit from the learning that's happening over thousands of buildings. You know, so yes, you can do it. But that that wealth of data 
greatly improves the efficiency. And a system that's run for uh, uh, two months is going to be more act, more uh, smarter than a system that's run for a week. Right. Of course. It, it, it continues to learn. You know, and if it if if it hears something it doesn't know, and we had this at a customer. We, I was just going to ask that. Goes, have you ever heard something that's just like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, we did. It was it was a large building, and and we go, you got an issue. They come, nope, everything's fine. We go, nope, got water running somewhere. Nope, everything's fine. So then they went out on a search, and they found out in the one room that used to be a lab, there was a pump running that nobody used that was under a sink area, and nobody knew it was even being used. Yeah. And so that pump was then removed because it wasn't supposed to be doing anything. <laughs> But, but yeah, but it, but we had to go back and forth a couple of times saying, no, something's happening here, yeah. right? Something is happening and it's related to water. Right. You know, now the system also has to be trained so that it doesn't pick up non-flow noise as flow noise, right. right? So we have filters in the systems that say, you know, when you and I are talking and you got a sensor behind you on your plumbing, it's not hearing us. It only wakes up when something happens in the plumbing. Okay. You know, and if somebody's beating on the plumbing with a, a hammer for some reason somewhere in the building. Yeah, it's going to pick that up, but it's going to go, geez, that's not flow. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's you know, some so idiot banging on my pipes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I laughed once because it was about two years ago. Uh, it was the DMV in San Francisco had to shut down for, I think it was five to six months because somebody on the outside of the building stole a three foot piece of copper pipe. Oh. And they stole the copper pipe, which had ru- water running then into the building. Yeah. And by the time anybody came back the next day, everything was so trash, they had to move out for a long time. Uh, and interestingly, our system, independent of the water, our system would have heard something was going on there. Yeah. Right? Right. <laughs> you know, it would have heard the saw on the... Uh, on the <laughs> hey, like, that's deal. not right. Yeah. And then it would have heard water, right? Yeah. So so it is interesting. I mean, you know, you, you don't think of that necessarily as a leak that was vandalism, but look what it did. It took a building out of commission yeah. for multiple months. Right. Is there like um maybe like a building size uh, minimum that you would recommend that these go into? Like, so if I'm a homeowner, you know, are you installing these in residential properties? I know you, maybe you tested them on residential properties, but can yeah. a homeowner I install mean- this too? The, it, yes, and it's a great solution. The thing is, as a, a young startup company, we focused on commercial buildings. Uh, we think that the value we bring is highest there. Right. In that the you know homeowners usually have insurance, and so if something goes wrong, they pay five hundred a thousand. The insurance company pays thirty thousand. Yeah. Um, you know, so the pain points differ. Commercial buildings have large deductibles, and these things come. But, you know, we are working now with a partner and we're open to any partners that want to take it to a consumer market. Uh, for us as a startup, going after a consumer market is very, uh, customer acquisition is very expensive. Yeah. And the amount of staffing you need to answer those 800 enough calls when they're installing and stuff. Right. Uh, it, it's not a fit for us now, but if we have a partner that wants to do that, it's absolutely a fit. Yeah. So it's. It's not our market focus now, but it, the it, technology is a, a fine fit yeah, for that. Right. It's possible. You could do it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So also, one of the other questions that I had, uh, I lost it. So maybe it'll come back to me. As you can tell, I'm crushing it as a host right now. But, um, you know, as we're going through this process and, you know, you have, uh, like, we talked a little bit about starting the company and the people that you brought on and, and all that kind of stuff. So one of the other things I always like to hear from, from, you know, particularly entrepreneurs who, you know, are starting a business and doing what you're doing and a lot of things like that. Um, talk to me about the importance of like the team, you know what I mean? Because I think that that's something that's really important, it, obviously like the technical side, but also just kind of like making sure the business is moving forward. Yeah. I mean, there is nothing more important to the startup than the team. Yeah. It's probably as important as the technology more so because it has to sustain that. Right. You know, and I think there's a real uh, kind of people that work well in startup and emerging growth companies and people that work better in large companies. Um, I believe you have to have a blend because you start small and you want to go large. So you can't start thinking you're always going to be a garage shop or you won't have the processes and the procedures. And with what we're doing, the security and the privacy requirements that yeah. you have to have, right? right. I mean, you have to, you have to think big on one scale. So we, we tend to like to find people that have both the entrepreneurial and the multinational company kind of experience. Uh, because you you don't off, you don't really get to have, there's no line of demarcation where we're no longer a startup right we're now this right yeah. you got to be blending that uh, but you also can't put the 
the weight of a large company and the decision making speed of a large company, which isn't always as quick and agile, or your ability to 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 change your whole direction if you need to. Right. Um, but the team's important, and it goes down to the the personalities of the team, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, and, and they, you can't have them alike. I mean, my, my first co-founder and myself, when we decided to do this, you know, if you, if you put us on a screen, we are like super opposite kinds of people, <laughs> Yeah. but we knew from our prior being at the solar company together that we worked really well together and we brought the, the capabilities we brought differently. were also very valuable to the yeah. team. Um, and so that's what we're always looking as we're hiring and we're, we tend to be looking for, um, not really what well, sort of renaissance employees, right? I mean, everybody wears multiple hats. Yeah. You know, like I ship a product sometimes. I'm a shipping clerk and I'm I'm really good at it, but I didn't start really good at it. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah. you know, everybody's happened to do that extra thing. And that's how startups are, you know, and some people, I mean, I find that totally fun, right? right. I mean, you know, if I if I get to go install a system, I get excited. I think that's that's fun. Yeah. Um, you know, so so it's that balance, but but it's not just chemistry because you need you need the uh, contentiousness as well, right? You need you know you need people to be able to push back that I don't think that's right. I need I need people to push me and say I I know you love that market, but look that's going to be really hard for us, right? Right. I mean you need it. You need that. I mean I sometimes say what's the you know what what do I drive for in a business from a management standpoint? And and at least the latest thing I think is critical is is absolute transparency. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I think that you have to be transparent among your team. I think you have to be transparent with your investors. Um, you know, I think you have to be reasonably transparent with your customers to a point, right? You don't want to, you know, over worry them. But but the more everybody's on the same page, yeah. And you're not trying to hide anything. The pat the, the the power it takes to drive forward is so much less than if you're doing it any other way. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, so that that's a real important part of the culture of our company as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, I remembered my other question that I asked, and that was a great answer, by the way. I love learning about that kind of stuff because we've had a lot of entrepreneurs in a lot of different areas of not only real estate but beyond, and it's like it's always the same answer. Like it's the people first, and then they just make everything else go. It's like not so much the product or the investment or whatever. The people are the most important product, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if you were going to say something. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, the product has to be there. The technology oh, for has sure. to be there. Right. And yeah, you, yeah. But you could have the greatest technology. Yeah. And a terrible and, team. And a team it doesn't matter. Stunned, yeah. And you'd be better off with a good team that could <laughs> fix technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so when I mentioned earlier uh, in this episode, and I think we talked about it on the phone, uh, one of the other episodes that we had on here uh, was with a guy who was ironically also named Michael Hamm. And he does... Um, uh, uh, healthy homes and healthy buildings and all that kind of stuff. So lead certifications and, and that type of thing. Does this fall under that umbrella? Is this part of that or not yet? Or is that a future thing? How does that play into this? You know, right now, it, I do not believe there is a, a lead item or a, a lead certification item around this type of product. Uh, but there clearly will be Yeah. with the emphasis on water efficiency. Uh, you know, it's something we probably should should start trying to drive with some partners. Uh, we haven't really had the bandwidth to do that yet. Yeah, but it's you know it's it allows a measurability of performance of a building uh, that you know that clearly contributes to the the purpose of of elites and sustainable building. I mean, it really fits in with the whole smart city movement as yeah. well. Right, right, definitely. I mean, you can have a smart city, but if the buildings in the city aren't smart. <laughs> The city's yeah. not quite as smart, right? right? It's pretty dumb. You know? <laughs> and it's just like if the people in the buildings aren't as smart, it's also not as smart. But, uh, you know, but but it, it does proliferate, right? You, yeah. you, you can talk buzzwords of smart cities and stuff, but if it doesn't get down to all those organisms and living buildings and and, and treat them like living buildings, not like structures, yeah. um, you know, you really can't get to the, the ultimate goals. Right. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree with that. So um, as we're on the topic of the future... Um, so I know that we talked, we talked about Aqua watch and then I know you mentioned Aqua manage, which is something that hoping you're hoping to roll out. I think you said in the next couple of months, right? Uh, the next five to six months, next five to six months. Um, <laughs> right. So, you know, uh, not couple five to six months, you know, hopefully, um, are there other things that you're hoping to accomplish with Aqua Seca, maybe even longer term? I know you said it's kind of like, you know, 
pun fluid. Um, but you know, like, are there things that you're like, Hey, like we want to do X, Y, Z over the next couple of years. Yes. And, um, it, it is interesting because, and, and, and I think my co-founders would totally agree with me on this. It's we've all been in startups before and you got to make a product and, and you make your product and then all of a sudden you go, okay, we're being pretty successful with our product. What do we do now? Yeah. And what, what we know with this product is it doesn't seem to have a end point in yeah. terms of what you could do. So within the built environment, if you will, which is where we're focused now, uh, there's so many more capabilities we can add to what the product does. The pre predictive failures, the the things that mean we're not fixing problems, we're finding them before the problems happen. The leak you find before it occurs because you got hammer in the pipelines. Yeah, you know, those kind of things. So that's one level. But then I've got I've got two more sprigs that go from there. Yeah. One one is other markets like agriculture. I mean, agriculture uses more water than any other industry, and right. it is wastes more water than any other you know, industry or, or environment. And so what we could do in that world to be able to monitor where water is being wasted is huge. Yeah. And there's been a lot of interest in that. The, another is our, our technology itself, our IP is all around fluids moving through pipes, not just water. Yeah. So we're very aqua focused now, Right. but this same technology could be licensed into oil or gas or chemical movement yeah. areas where where leaks are much more catastrophic than they are with water. Um, and the same principles still apply. It would be a different version of the product and it probably means we'd partner with somebody in that industry and make this ability to bring data analytics to pipelines, uh, moving other things uh, a possibility. Yeah. So it, it just kind of goes on. And then, you know, of course there's the home market, which is a whole different entity, um, but, a, but a very exciting one. Yeah. If you can look at your phone and know, your usage from everything without having to just be guessing. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so there's a lot of, a lot, you know, wh which of those we go to first, we right. don't know. Yeah. I know for the next year, year and a half, we'll be driving forward on our current path of the built environment. Um, but the channels off of that through partners or licensing or whatever also uh, are, are opportunities. Yeah. All right. So I just got an idea. Right. And you could use this. And if it works, just give me a call and we can talk how we work that out. But yeah, we're going to we're going to be here on this episode. So we could always refer back to it. Would this oh, ever yes. work? Like take like you were talking about smart cities and, and stuff like that. Take a sewer system in a city. Could this work if there are like issues within the, the pipes underneath the city, you know, like tracking and managing that that type of stuff? Um, yeah, that stuff in the sewer stuff you want to just call stuff, right? Right. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily I mean, water, I guess. The answer is I'm I'm not sure. I the acoustic approach could, but one of the things in a building, you know, our our technology is dealing now with pipes that are under pressure. Okay. Water coming into a building sure. under pressure, moving somewhere. Uh, whether or not it can be adapted to the equivalent of drain, yeah, or whether the sewers because they're moving stuff with pressure, uh, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible it to, that it could be used to identify clogs. Sure. And those types of things. I, I can't say definitively, right. logically, it would seem possible. Yeah. Uh, I don't but, know. It know, just, we, it was one of those things where like the idea popped into my head and I just had to like yeah. blurt it out to you. Yeah. So, <laughs> for example, at my house, I, I, I had had a, uh, in, in the wall behind from the upstairs to the downstairs, I had a leak and, uh, and it was, it, I, the, the sheetrock kind of felt cold and then it kind of looked wet. And it was a process over <laughs> several weeks, yeah. right? Um, turned out it was a drain line. It wasn't a freshwater line. Yeah. So it would have taken our, if our system picked it up, it would have taken a lot longer because it was just stuff flowing down. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so we've been focused on the water that's under pressure that when something ruptures, whew, water goes everywhere. Right. Um, but there are countless, you know, I mean, acoustics have been used, is used in jet engines to know what's happening in the air when people are between here and Sydney. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, the whole acoustic has a phenomenal amount of opportunity when coupled with what you can now do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah. Very cool. This is a very cool thing. I, I really enjoyed this episode so far. Um, so we're going to move this uh, into our closing segment, which we call Under the Spotlight. So the Spotlighters have been listening to Mike Ham and Nancy Hartsock talk for 45 minutes already. 
Um, so a little bit longer than I told you we were going to go, but I was just so interested in this and then had to share my idea because to make myself sound smart. Um, so, uh, what would be one thing that you would want them to walk away from this episode with? So you're under the spotlight. So to me, the, the, the most important thing people need to grasp is that water is our most limited resource. Um, and, you know, we always think, well, it's just a little water or it's, you know, my, I don't impact it much or anything, but it is, you know, we don't ever get any more. I mean, we can desalinate other water. So to, to not, I mean, people need to understand whether they're at work or they're at home or wherever they are, you know, that water that is being wasted yeah. is, it may only cost you a few cents a gallon. Right. But it's way, way more valuable than that. Yeah. And uh, and so to put value on it and beyond its current cent value, if you will, I think is the most important thing we have to do. I mean, yeah. sustainability yeah. has to move out of electricity and and CO2 and, and really focus on this water area in right. the big areas. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Great under the spotlight. I know you were a little bit nervous about it, which everybody is before they get there. But that was great. That was perfect under the spotlight. Um, so people need to learn more about you, more about Aquaseca. They're interested in installing one of these in one of their buildings. Where can they go to get more information and to reach out to you guys? Yeah. So if you go to our website, which is www.aquaseca.com, pretty common website, yep. um, you'll find all any other links. Uh, you'll find emails to way to get to me, phone number, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you. Yeah, we'd like to talk to partners. We like to talk to customers. We like to talk to investors. Awesome. Um, so all of all of that's great. Uh, and you know, partnering is a is a key part of our DNA, actually. Yeah, so. right. I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. Um, awesome. So I'll make sure that I put aquaseca.com in the show notes for everybody that wants to go learn more. I'll also put the morningspotlight.com and the morningspotlight at gmail.com in the show notes as well. Uh, if you want to reach out to the show or reach out to me to get to Nancy, I'd be happy to make that introduction as well. Always happy to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, uh, Nancy, thank you so much for coming on with us today and teaching me about all this kind of stuff. And it was, this was great. Thank you, Mike. It was a real pleasure. I, I enjoyed it very much. Awesome. I, I'm glad about that. And the Spotlighters, thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>